Okay, well, today we are in John chapter 2. My name, if you're watching this and, and you haven't seen this before, my name is Scott McCormick. We're going to be going through the Gospel of John, and this is our ninth session, and we're only still in John chapter 2. Uh, but John chapter 2 is pretty short, so we're going we're gonna to wrap it up today. Um, we've, we've seen the, the prologue of the Gospel of John. We've seen the testimony of John the Baptist. We've seen Jesus inviting his first disciples to come and follow him. And then we've seen his first miracle at the wedding in Cana. And before we do a little reading, I want us to kind of, oh, that, that, that color is terrible. We got to do, we got to do blue. Forgive me. My marker's messed up. There it is. All right. I'm Mr. Scott. We're in John chapter two. And who can tell me um, where the wedding was that Jesus performed that first miracle? I want us to get a sense ge geographically where we were. That'll kind of help us in our setting today. The name was Cana, but I do not recall geographically where it, it was. It was in Cana. That's correct. So we started with John the Baptist down here at Bethany on the Jordan River. This is the Sea of Galilee right here. And then the, the territory of Galilee is on this side. Galilee, that's terrible. If this is how the rest of this lesson is going to go, y'all are in for a real treat. There's Galilee. Guess we won't have to worry about being on YouTube. That's yeah. right. No. This one's not going to make the cut. It's going to be funny if this one is the yeah, I'm one not wearing makeup. <laughs> so Cana is where Nathaniel is from. And uh, he's one of the disciples that follow Christ. Also in Galilee is Nazareth. And you may have heard of a guy who came from Nazareth. His name's Jesus. So after they left Cana, they went to a place called Capernaum. Capernaum uh, is on the Sea of Galilee. They stayed there for just a few days because later, where they're going to go now, today, as we study, they're going to go to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is where the Passover feast is held. That's where we're headed. So there's three of us, and there's a lot of scripture for us to read today. So we're just going to take turns. Um, Matt, if you could read for me, we're going to be in John chapter 2, verses 13 through uh, 25 total. But if you'll go ahead and just read for me 13 through 17. Uh, Claudia, if you'll read after that, verses 18 through 22, and then I'll finish up the chapter. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples re remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? Uh, okay, um, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So this is, um, this is a side of Jesus that we don't, talk about very much. I mean, we, we talk about Jesus' love. We talk about his compassion, his meekness, his teaching. Um, we talk about the transfiguration and his visible glory there. We talk about his crucifixion and the week leading up to that. But here we see an instance of Jesus's righteous indignation towards something that's going on in the temple. So I, I want to draw first for us a little picture of, of what the temple looked like this is sort of a, a basic view of the temple. 
pardon the squiggly lines here, but the, this, this outer court, this outer court was also called the court of Gentiles. This is where Gentiles were allowed to go and to worship and, and, and to participate there. There's an inner court where the Jews could go and, and also worship. And inside this part, who knows what this inner part was called? The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is the place, I missed a letter there. It, it's the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. This is where the golden lamp stands were, the, the cherubim overshadowing the mercy seat, which was the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. The, uh, the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments were in there. And that's a room that the high, only the high priest, and there was only one high priest each year, could go in just one day of the year in order to do some of the uh, things prescribed in the law as part of their worship. And so that's sort of the layout of the temple. And when Jesus arrives at the temple, he finds in the court of the Gentiles these booths and tables selling oxen and sheep and doves and pigeons. And it's almost like he immediately turns around. He, he walks in, sees what's going on, and walks right back out to go do something. What does he go do as a result of this? He makes his whip of cords. He goes to make a whip. So here's Jesus. Here's whip Jesus down here with his whip, okay? And that look that may look long to you. My brother owns a bull whip uh, that he got in college. He thought it'd be cool to buy one. He had a buddy who makes them. These are very long. Um, and when you crack them, I mean, they make a real good snap. They're good for driving animals down, uh, driving animals along in the direction you want them to go. And it takes a while to make one of these. Like, this is not a 15-minute project. To make a nice whip that you could drive all these animals out with, Jesus sat down and took some time to make the tool he needed to go in and do this. And when he goes into the temple, he starts cracking that whip and driving the animals out. It doesn't say that he whipped the people. I don't think it says that. But he did drive the animals out, and he drove out the money changers by turning over their tables. So here's, here's table flip Jesus. He's flipping the table over, <laughs> and the money's falling all over the ground. And, and then he goes over to where the doves are, are being held, and, and how do you, how do you keep a dove? Where, where would you keep a dove or a pigeon? Uh, generally in a little cage. Yeah, so here's my, here's a little bird, and they're in cages like this. Here's another one. They're in cages, so you can't crack a whip and drive them out. So you have to tell the people, get these things out of here. Pick up your merchandise and walk out, and that's what he does. And my first question to ask is why? Number one, how did we get into this situation? Why are there money changers and sellers of animals in the temple in the first place? This wasn't something set up when God was giving rules for this is what you're going to have in the temple. Nowhere did it say you're going to have people that sell animals and, and exchange money. What was the purpose for all of that? You got any clue? Well, there was... Yeah, I mean, the ceremonial law did require certain kinds of sacrifices. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, one reason would be a matter of convenience. You know, well, if you're not a rancher and you don't have these animals, you buy them and sacrifice them. Good. It was mostly a matter of convenience. So prescribed by law for different sins, for different kinds of sacrifices, there were different animals required. Some required small animals. Some required larger animals, and, and, and in a sense, part of that was also what you could afford. You know, if, if, you're, um, if you could afford more, then, then that was also part of it. In addition, it says that there were money changers. And, and the thing I want us to see in our mind when we hear money changers is sort of like when you need to travel to another country. So, Claudia, if you were to go visit family in Italy, not right now, but at another time, then they use a different system of money than we do in the United States. And you would need to exchange your US dollars for some other currency. Here in the temple, the temple tax was paid for with what's called a die drachma. 
It's a two drachma coin. This is the same coin that in, for, uh, in Matthew, Peter is questioned by somebody in the temple who asks Peter, hey, uh, does your master, meaning Jesus, pay the temple tax? And Peter, not really thinking my master is Lord of the temple and all of the taxes technically belong to him, he, he just sort of knee-jerk reaction said, oh yeah, my master, he obeys the, the laws, so, so sure, he pays the temple tax. Jesus pulls him aside and, and gives him a little lecture, but then also miraculously provides for this by sending Peter on a fishing expedition. He catches a fish, and inside the fish's mouth is two didrachma coins, which he can then pay for both of them. So this is that same coin. And if you don't have a didrachma, you've got to now exchange whatever money you have with you for this coin so you can pay the temple tax. So here we've got money changers and we've got sellers of animals to provide for the sacrifices. And Jesus walks in and he's coming to what he calls in verse 16, my father's house. He calls this my father's house. And, and that's important here. This place was intended to be a place of prayer, a place of teaching, a place of quiet reflection. When you walk in the door, it's supposed to feel holy and set apart from the world. That this is a place that is different from everywhere else. But when he walked in, he found something that was much different. He found, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Aladdin, where they're walking through the bazaar in the Middle East there in Agrabah, and you've got the hawkers and vendors, hey, come by my cows, they're better. If you need to exchange money, come over here, and you hear the bleeding of cows and sheep, and not the animals that have been brought for, just for sacrifice, but there's uh, sort of like an inventory of livestock there. In other words, there's more than there should be there. You're bumping around tables, trying to get through to where you need to go to do worship instead of being able to walk freely through in a calm way, mindful of spiritual things. And so he is rightly and righteously um, frustrated by this. He's angry about this. The word here used in, um, in 17, zeal for your house will consume me. This is a reference to Psalm 69.9, which you can go, um, go read sometime, um, that, that he was eaten up with zealousness for the sanctity and the holiness and the set-apartness of his father's house. So he begins to drive them out. Somebody read for me verse 16 again. Matt, can you do that? Yeah. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. My father's house. Here, this, this is something that, um, as you study this passage, John here, chronologically speaking, has put this event at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In other words, if I look at a timeline Let's say this is the baptism of Christ. From there, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. He returned and began to call his disciples. Uh, a few days later, we go to the wedding to turn water into wine. And then there's a good three years before we get to where um, the other gospels put this event. In other words, there's water into wine and then Right here is where we are cleansing the temple. And way out here, three years later, there's another cleansing of the temple as, as placed by the other disciples, uh, the other apostles. So flip with me. Keep a finger in John chapter 2. Flip with me to the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew in chapter 21. Matthew doesn't include a lot of details here. 21, what's the verse? 12 and 13. Literally, it's just two verses. Claudia, can you read those two verses for me? Sure. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers 
and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den, den of robbers. And it's interesting because I know he keeps on referring to the house of my father and Jesus sees it as a very holy, sacred place, mm -hmm. the house of my father. But this whole thing about trade, it wasn't just that they were providing animals for them to sacrifice, because that sounds like, oh, that's in alignment with what God's requirements were for sin at that point. They were doing more than that. I mean, the money changers, I, I, I would, I would, I haven't looked at the translation, but money mm -hmm. changes when you think of um, profit, gain, you know, negotiation, trying to get swindled. And, and so that's what he was angry about, that here in the outer courts, there was all this bargaining and negotiation going on and taking advantage of people and making money, making mm -hmm. money, making profit in his father's house. Mm -hmm. And that's not of the things of God. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So here in the, the verses that you've just read, um, there's some slight differences between what goes on here and and later, in, in the part that we read in John, it said, my father's house. Here, he says, my house. He says, my oh, house. Oh, good, good catch. I never saw that. That's cool. And so it's almost as though um, the first time this happens, which happens in the Gospel of John, at the beginning of his ministry, he's referring to it as his father's house. He's a relatively unknown rabbi. I mean, he's only got five disciples. He's at the beginning of his ministry. When That's cool. He, when he cleanses the temple in Matthew, look up in your Bible. Just look one section before the beginning of Matthew 21. It's the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life. Yeah. So right here, you know, we've got the triumphal entry, and then the very next thing he does is go in and cleanse the temple again. Mm -hmm. So here, these two events sort of bookend Jesus's ministry. It's one of the first things that he did was to go in and cleanse the temple, and it's one of the last things that he did when he goes in. But the second time he goes in, he calls it my house, um, and at this point, people know who he is, and it, it, he's getting to the point where the ultimate fulfillment of his role as Messiah is going to become apparent. In a week, he's going to be crucified, um, have died, been buried, and then raise again, and he'll appear to many people as a resurrected Savior. Um, so for him to say, this temple is my house, is, is appropriate there. And, and so I wanted us to see, you know, he actually did this twice. We're, we're, we're just going to study this one in John chapter 1, in John chapter 2, sorry. Um, but this happened twice, and there's a little bit of difference. So it's, he's been He's come back during that time, during that three years. But while he's been gone, these influences have crept back into the temple. This was not a permanent thing. He drove them out and they left, but it's not a permanent thing. It, it came back. Um, I, one of the things, one of the questions that comes up as we study this part of John chapter 2 is if we if we look at the temple at that time and we consider who was there while this was going on at that time, on average, there could have been upwards of 2000 people inside the temple on a given day. This is also during Passover. So it could have been even more than that. We, we want to remember that there's also a temple guard, a garrison of soldiers whose job it was to maintain order and protect the people from riots and from harm. And in the midst of that setting, with that great multitude of people there, in addition to the animals and all of the hardware that it took to do all of this commerce, one man with a whip goes through and clears the whole temple out, drives out all of the money changers, all of the vendors, and all of their merchandise. That's good. another good point, Scott. With one whip. And the question is, is how does he do it? Now, I mean, it's easy for us to say, well, he's God, he can do all things. But if we think about it, you know, one of the questions that came up Wednesday when I talked about this was, were, were they just, were they just, did they feel so guilty because of what they were doing and that's why they left? Well, that's why they left so easily. They knew it was wrong. So then they, they left. I think that's part of it. When, when we're confronted by our sin, 
and we feel that guilt, that's hard to run from. The Holy Spirit presses that in on us to remind us of our sins so that we can repent and be forgiven. So that's part of it, but we also want to consider the person who's got the whip in his hand and, and the power that he has even in his voice. So I want us to see an example of that. Flip with me to John chapter 18. This is towards the end of Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 18, Jesus has returned to Jerusalem for uh, the Passover feast again, and he has cleansed the temple. He's had the Last Supper with his disciples, and now he's gone to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will, he's going to pray, and he knows that this is the location where they will come and arrest him. So this is the account of his betrayal and arrest, according to John. Matt, if you'll read for me, um, John chapter 18. Forgetting to write my references in the corner here. We're looking at John 18, verses 1 through 8. Actually, tell, tell you what, read 1 through 11. Okay. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the book Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have, not, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Very good. So here we see um, a, an amazing picture of the power of Christ. There in the garden... Here's Jesus, and he's got disciples, you know, sort of around and behind him. And coming into the garden are soldiers who are armed. These are not wimpy guys, all right? Their job is to fight. We've got spears and swords and shields. They come to Jesus, and he addresses them and says, whom do you seek? And they say, well, Jesus of Nazareth. And he responds by saying in the English, I am he... In the Greek, this it's the, the he is 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 not there. It's just I am. He he responds by giving the sacred name that the sovereign God of Moses gave when Moses said, Who is it that's speaking to me out of this burning bush? And he says, I am is speaking to you. And when Moses says, Well, who should I tell the Israelites when I and when I come to them from God to, to, to rescue them, who shall I say sent me? Say that I am sent you. Jesus is now giving that name to himself. He says, I am. And just the power of speaking that name drives the men in front of him to their knees. Big, burly, strong, rough men with weapons who had come to arrest him drove them to their knees on the ground by speaking. He didn't have to lay a hand on them. We see in that instance that when they arrest Jesus, it's only because he's allowed it to happen. If he can drive them off by the word of his voice, when he allows them to arrest him and even crucify him, Jesus speaks truly when he says, I lay down my life and I can take it back up again. Because no one could actually take his life. He laid it down of his own accord. He allowed them to do it. Back in John chapter 2, this is the same man. This is the same Jesus who had the power to drive men to their knees with the sound of his voice. 
This is the same guy running through the temple with a whip, cracking it and driving the money changers and the vendors and, and, and all that out. So even though he didn't use, I mean, I, I understand the I am and the power of the I am and how it even, you can go back to the Pentateuch where um, the, the father uses I am that I am and all. Um, but in the temple, the one we're studying today, he's not, he doesn't use that, those words. So you just say, you're alluding to just his mere presence was enough to get rid of 2,000 people in the Etta court. Oh, right. I mean, I, I can say the word. The power was not in the words. The power that I'm saying is in the person. The power is in Christ. When he speaks, we got to think, who is the man that we're talking about? Um, he's only taken on flesh at this point for 30 years. Before that, he was a divine spirit-only being. He's the same being that in the beginning it says God spoke and the world was created. That was through Christ. That's the man whose power we're talking about. And, um, and so when he speaks, things happen. That it's not just this name that's magical. It's the power is in his person. So when he drives them out, it's not because he's been imbued with some power outside of himself, like Samson was in the Old Testament. Samson's strength did not come from himself. It came from the Lord. But here, Jesus' power comes from himself because he is the God-man. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Very good. So here at, at, at this point, you know, you, you brought up, was it, uh, it wasn't just that they were selling things in the temple that it was inappropriate. They were, uh, they were doing so for profit. And in many cases, I'm sure they were doing so for, um, for unrighteous profit. You know, they were, they were cheating people. That's, that's one thing to look at. I had a question that came up Wednesday of, well, well, how about when we have people come to our church, you know, visiting preachers or musicians who come, and then they, they go and they sell books and CDs and stuff in the lobby. Is that inappropriate? You know, considering the story that we're looking at here is what they're doing inappropriate in comparison to that. The answer that I gave Wednesday um, that I think is true is, is that what really came down to the matter here was a matter of what was the intent of the place where they were. We, we need to remember that when we talk about a church or a temple, these are buildings. So when we talk about the church, we're talking about people. That's you and me. All of those who belong to the body of Christ are the church. A church is a building, and it's appropriate to have a sense of place in a building. God prescribes that in the Old Testament it's not inappropriate for us to have a similar sense of that in the New Testament church that we live in now. So when we have a building and it has an intended purpose, there's places in that building that are set aside for worship. There's places set aside for quiet prayer and reflection, spaces set aside for teaching of the word of God. And if we were to sort of hijack those places and use them for commerce or personal gain, then that would be inappropriate. Um, you know, so if they were to set up shop in the middle of the sanctuary while we're trying to worship, that would be inappropriate. If it's something that's out in the lobby or in the hallway and you're, you're purchasing these things, not for their personal gain, but for the, to support their ministry so they can continue to serve people elsewhere. I think that's very appropriate. But an example I could give of this is, um, I was telling my wife, we were going to be studying this passage. And she said that when she was young, growing up, she was in Girl Scout. She used to sell Girl Scout cookies. And she would take them to church, and people would say, I want to buy Girl Scout cookies from you. And she would tell them, okay, I'll sell it to you, but we got to go outside the sanctuary to do it because that's not appropriate to do here. And they were really impressed, the little girl. you know, She was just brought up that way. That's what her parents taught her. You can do this, but you can't do it in the sanctuary. You need to go outside because that's not what this place is for. So that, that's the example I want to give there. Um, so let's move on. I bet you she sold a lot of Girl Scout cookies as a result of that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. She and I are not salespeople. So um, I think as a little kid, it's, it's easier to do that kind of stuff when you, you grow up and you get scared to, to offer things to people. Um, so in verse 18, 
As you can imagine, this is not totally unopposed. He does drive all of the people out of the temple with their merchandise, but the Jews raise a complaint. In verse 18, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus responds in an interesting way. He's kind of just done a big, it, John doesn't call it a sign, but it's an obvious display of his power. But what is his response to them when they ask for a sign? I dare you. <laughs> Tear down this temple. <laughs> well, I like that you say, I dare you, because the way he says it kind of sounds like that. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it in three days. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I know what he's referring to. We have the benefit of hindsight, and John even helps us to understand it in verse uh, 21 and 22. But in the moment, the Jews there took what he said to be quite literal. Now, I've seen some commentators that said maybe he was sort of doing this, tapping on his chest, pointing to himself. It doesn't say that. So that's sort of like us reading into it. Because we don't really know that John, I don't think from what's written here, that John, who is writing this gospel, understood what Jesus meant until it had been fulfilled. If we look in verses 21 and 22, it says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So not even John, who's writing this gospel, understood that. And the, the Jews took it very literal. They thought he meant the temple that they were standing in. And they said, wait a minute, it took 46 years to build this temple. Now, this was not the same temple. Um, all right, let's see here. The temple is his body, but they took it to mean um, the actual temple. But this actual temple they were standing in was not the original temple built by Solomon. This is one that's been rebuilt after the exile. The Israelites returned from Babylon and, and rebuild the temple. And it... We, we drew it as this nice, clean rectangle, but there were many other rooms and additions and add-ons um, that took a total of 46 years to build. That's why they make that 46-year comment. You know, it, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it in three days? This challenge that he gives him comes back to haunt him, which is a strange thing to say about Jesus, but comes back to haunt him. At the cross towards the end of his ministry, before the cross, while he is in... Um, oh, um, he's being questioned, right? That's right. And I, I want us to read it. So flip, keep a finger in John. We're going to go back to Matthew, but this time we're going to be in chapter 26. It's like Thursday before the Good Friday. I think it's right when he's going before John 26. Yes. Matthew 26. No. Matthew 26, not John 26. Sorry. Matthew 26. And I think, Matt, you read last. Yep. Uh, Claudia, if you'll read for me when you get there, Matthew 26, verses 57 through 63. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had, had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that, that they may put him to death, they, but they found none. But many false witnesses came forward. At, at last, two came forward and said, This man said, I'm about to, I, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Very Which good. So what is the claim that these false witnesses bring against Jesus? What, what did they say he said? That he was going to tear down the temple. That he was going to tear down the temple. Is that what he said in John chapter 2? No, John chapter 2 says, um, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Right. Destroy the temple. You do it. If you do it, when you do it, 
I'll raise it up in three days. And he's talking about his body. They said he came along like a terrorist saying, I'm going to tear down this temple and then by my own brute strength, rebuild it in three days. Yeah, they, they twisted his words around. They twisted it. Well, so part of it, you know, I, obviously they're trying to get him in trouble. There's some false witness here. But let's remember our timeline in John chapter 2. We're at the beginning of his ministry. This arrest, and now he's standing before Caiaphas in the Sanhedrin. This is three years later. Three whole years, somebody has been holding on to this waiting for Jesus to get in trouble so they could use it and mm. twist it to attack him. That's amazing to me. They've been holding on to that for three years. Somebody walked in and he, he, here comes Jesus and somebody goes, hey, there's that guy. I remember him three years ago. What did he say he was going to do? He said he was going to destroy the temple and then rebuild it in three days. And somebody overhears him and says, oh, oh will you tell them that? Will you say that in, uh, on the record? to get him in trouble. That's what's going on here. And that's interesting to me that that, uh, that one phrase that he gave it was twisted three years later. And that's not even what he was talking about. He was making a reference to his own body. Um, this is the same thing that happens when the Jews come to him and ask him for a sign. And what does he say? He says, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah who was in the belly of the well for three days, so will the Son of Man um, be buried for three days and rise again. And, and so that's the, he's always pointing, they want a sign, I'll give you a sign. Look, wait for my resurrection. That'll be the sign to you that I am who I say I am. Right. Mm. Now, it's easy for us to look at this whole story and like read the whole Gospel of John and go, what? there were all these signs and what were they waiting for? What we, were they? See, we have hindsight now. We have, yeah. we have this and they didn't. Now, I think more bad, importantly, though. we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, like this is a, another yeah. example similar to the parables where Jesus can say one thing and those whose eyes have been opened by the Spirit see the meaning maybe not right away like you're talking about but later on the disciples look back and say that's what this meant that confirms it where those who have not had their eyes opened uh are never going to understand they're never going to see it they're they don't get the meaning um, mm -hmm. yep absolutely so here john wraps up chapter two with a sort of a summary statement of what goes on the rest of the time Jesus is in town for the Passover. In John chapter 2, verses 23, he says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, plural, the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Two things to note here. Um, cleansing the temple was not the only thing Jesus did while he was in town for the Passover. He was constantly doing works of healing, of teaching, of uh, miraculous um, signs to prove who he was. And it says that many believed in his name as a result. But there's a qualifier here. It says that he did not entrust himself to them. And the root word for believed in this context here is the same root word used for entrust. And it's so it's almost to try and, and give us the understanding that they believe, but Jesus did not believe in their believing. That there was a superficiality to their understanding of his person that there was a, um, their believing was a temporal thing, that it was a worldly thing. Oh, here's a guy who can do great things. Let's follow him for a while. Here's a guy who can feed us miraculously. Let's follow him for a while. And we see people like that show up frequently in the Gospels, uh, who, who trusted in Jesus for a time and, and fell away because their trust was not actually in him as their Savior, as the Messiah, it was as uh, someone who could provide for them, who could put on a good show, who said nice words that they liked to hear. And so he does not really believe in their believing. And how does he know, though, whether or not they really believe? 
in 25, it says, he, he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. This points back to what we've already seen in John chapter 1, when he sees Nathaniel coming, and he tells him, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Here comes a true Israelite indeed. And when he refers to Peter, not just by his given name, but also tells him what his, his, his new name will be, Peter. It was Simon, but you shall be called Peter as a reference to what he would become. So we see him seeing the past in a person, seeing their future. And here he's seeing at their core who they really are, whether or not they really do believe in him and whether or not he should entrust himself to them and expose his true nature as the Messiah. Um, there's part, there's something that I skipped over. All right. Flip back with me just a second. Look at verse 22. Um, in, in John still? In John. Yes. Sorry. John, uh, I, I missed this part. John chapter two, verse 22, it says his disciples remembered he had said this and they believed the scripture and all the words that he had spoken. Mm -hmm. They believed the scripture. This is in reference to the Old Testament scriptures. And it doesn't say they believed a specific verse or a particular book in the Old Testament. They believed the Old Testament because of what they saw in Jesus um, when this prophecy was accomplished. So when he was raised again and the Holy Spirit helped them to remember this and remember the scripture and the things that he had taught, they believed the scripture as a result. And the thing I want us to, to see here is flip with me. We've got just a few minutes left. Flip with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24. And we're not going to read all of 24 here today, um, but particularly this account of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Um, these are disciples who had followed Jesus they, this is after the resurrection of Christ. The women who have gone to the tomb and found it empty, then they came and told the disciples, they came and found the tomb empty too, and now they don't know really what to do about all this. Um, some say he's risen. They're not sure. And they start walking towards a village called Emmaus, and Jesus, now resurrected, sidles up next to them on their journey and hides his identity from them. And when he asks them what they're talking about, they say, well, don't you know about this Jesus who came and all of these things that happened to him? And now we're scared and we don't know what to do. And look with me in Luke 24. I'm going to start in um, verse 25. He said to them, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Yeah, I, I think we see it here and back into your reference about the scripture. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think of the Pentateuch and Jesus is a fulfillment of the law. It's, it's not necessarily you know, it's the old and the new, and it keeps on, there's a reference to him, there's a reflection, there's a mirror image of him in that. Yep. So good, good scriptures on both of them. Absolutely. Just yeah, and in, in the Old Testament, as far back as Genesis chapter three, we see the very first promise of the gospel when mm -hmm. it says that the son of Eve, that the, um, the seed of Eve will stomp on the head of the servant, Serpent, I'm going to totally misquote that, so I'd rather just flip back there and read it. This is called the Proto-Evangelion. This is the first gospel in Genesis chapter 3. We'll crush the head of the serpent, I think it was. Um, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, but you you shall bruise his heel. So this is pointing forward to a promised son, a, a son of promise to Jesus ultimately is where this is fulfilled. The man who would come and destroy Satan's influence over the world. Um, then we see the promises to Abraham in all, it, in your offspring shall all of the earth be blessed. That's ultimately fulfilled in Christ. 
uh, we see the promises made to David that there would always be a son of David, a, a, a Davidic king on the throne in Israel for eternity. That's fulfilled in Christ. When we get to um, Psalms, many of the Psalms are Messianic Psalms. They refer directly to the coming Savior. We get to the book of Isaiah, where we learn about the new covenant. The new covenant is instituted by Jesus. And so all of the scriptures from Moses to the prophets point forward to the cross. And it's not until the disciples um, see this fulfilled after his resurrection that now they go back and believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And that's how we wrap up chapter two. And next week we're going to get into chapter three where Jesus is going to have a very deep conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Um, we're going to spend longer than two weeks in chapter three. A, it's longer, and B, there's some hard stuff in John chapter three. There's some stuff we're going to need to spend some extra time on. Yeah. Have you guys seen, real quick, um, the series The Chosen? Um, I, yeah, is, the Chosen. <laughs> Siri's answering me. Thanks, Siri. Um, highly recommended. It's, it's, um, they've taken the life of Jesus Christ, and really they're... Their desire is, is to, like, you know, the Netflix series where you see season one, season two. Phenomenal job. I've never seen anything like this before. It's free. You can go online. You could download, not download it, just stream it to your, your uh, so when you're shut in, highly mm -hmm. recommend it. Why I'm mentioning it is they go into the life of Nicodemus, and it is so moving, the struggle that Nicodemus has, because he knows Jesus is the Christ, mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's this internal struggle with who he is and the pharisaic nature and the understanding that this is um, Messiah. And they read into it a little bit, but they're pretty close to scripture. They're just some beautiful scenes, highly recommended if you guys haven't seen the series. They're in season two now filming, but it's phenomenal. Season one will bring you to tears. So, so there's, this isn't like through Netflix, this is on a website somewhere? This is not through Netflix. It's like a Netflix series, but it's called The Chosen. And if you Google it, you can get access to the free, there's like, I think eight episodes in season one and they're filming season two. Um, they've done a phenomenal job. So Nicodemus is one of the um, characters that they, they're following a lot of different stories around at one time, the woman at the well, mm -hmm. you know, um, just awesome, just awesome. Make it past season uh, episode one and all of a sudden episode two, everything comes to life. So well, good. it reminded me of The Chosen because of Nicodemus. And yeah. I never look at Nicodemus again after seeing The Chosen. <laughs> well, very good. Yeah. Well, then you've got a head start on us as we get into Nicodemus. Yeah. Um, excellent. Maybe you'll enjoy it. All right, guys. Thank you. This has been a real long, heavy week. And I have my email blowing up, but I said I really wanted to be here today. So well, good. Thank you for coming stopping. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Very good. Well, um, unless y'all have any other questions or, or thoughts, I'll go ahead and close in prayer. Sure. Awesome. Dear Lord, you are good to us in every single way. We, we cannot count the blessings that we have. There are things that you, you, you shower on all of the earth. Um, you rain on, you, you send the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous but on those who believe you have stored up treasures for us in heaven that we look forward to. We look forward to seeing you face to face and in the midst of deep and very difficult trials on this earth, we know that our hope is in Christ. That's the assurance that we have, that we will one day spend an eternity with a God um, whose love for us knows no bounds. And we're grateful for that, Lord. We thank you, amen. 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 Thanks. Be safe, guys. God bless. You too. Have a good week. You See you too. later. Thanks, Scott.